Hi, um, this is Michael Humphreys, and I'm here with Kate uh, Rayworth, economist and author, who's just given a paper to the Joint Planning Law Conference 2017. Kate's keynote paper to the conference was based on her best-selling new book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. The central message in the book is that economic growth cannot continue indefinitely, and that economists, government, and indeed the rest of us, need to think about how we will need to live within certain social and environmental bounds, the donuts. If you want to know more about the donut, look at the animations on Kate's website at www.kateraworth.com. Kate, um, we've just come out of uh, the uh, conference hall, and I kind of want to pick up a few themes um, that you were talking about. Um, you know, for so long in um, kind of Western uh, uh, economics, Western economies, we've thought about the idea of personal advancement, personal prosperity, as being very much linked with uh, economic growth. Does a low growth, no growth uh, future mean the end of increasing personal prosperity? So, great to jump in with a big question. The character of man at the heart of economic theory was created, I'd say, first of all, by John Stuart Mill, who took Adam Smith's nuanced picture of humanity and said, well, this is too complicated, we need something simple. And he said, man in political economy, this doesn't treat the whole of man in society, we create him as a being who desires to possess wealth. So the character of humanity in economics was given this DNA idea that we were just creatures who desired to possess wealth and more wealth, that we hate work and we love luxury. It's an incredibly narrow view of who we are, and one of the most extraordinary things is that it shapes who we become. So the more economic students learn about this character, rational economic man, the more they say they value self-interest over interest in others. We begin to believe the stories that we're told about us. Yes, we're competitive, and yes, people want more and want to, they love novelty and would like more things and, and bet to be better off, but that is not at all the only thing we desire. Look at how most people actually behave. We're incredibly altruistic. We're co cooperative, raising our families, working with our neighbours. People aren't actually work-hating. They're purpose-seeking. And sometimes purpose doesn't come in line with the highest salary. People often will leave a higher income behind because they found a greater purpose in life. And those are the people with real light in their eyes. And I think in the book you talk about the idea of, is it the, the commons? Uh... Yes, the idea of the commons where people communities get together without using the market, without the state but communities self-organising to produce things they value, whether it's a, a neighbourhood garden on the corner of the street block or whether it's Wikipedia online. People donate and their time and their skills because they see purpose more than uh, just their own income. So we're competitive, but we're also socially reciprocating, which means that we expect others to cooperate with us. And when they don't, we punish them. We will punish those who renege, and, th and this is one of the major mechanisms that makes society work. We cooperate together and we punish those who don't. And, and that kind of leads into a, a second theme I just want to kind of touch on with you, in that um, w when you read the book, and I think this sort of will have come through in the, the paper you've just given um, as, as well, it's clear, or it seemed clear to me, that many of the ideas... Um, depend on or assume a certain amount of cooperation or coordination between economic players, whether it's kind of governments or companies or, or, or individuals within the system. And I'm interested to understand, is there a, a, a risk to this of you know, the classic prisoner's dilemma? If everyone cooperates, uh, the whole uh, does best. But if one or two players don't cooperate, they cheat on the system and do the best for themselves... They might do better, but everyone else does worse. And, and how, how does one kind of co uh, you know, deal with that? Yeah, it is an important question because as we were talking about this idea of being social reciprocators, we know that we thrive best when we cooperate. I mean, a society in which everyone was competing against everyone would get absolutely nowhere because we're deeply interdependent for meeting our needs. So we need structures and mechanisms that actually allow people to cooperate and and, and push out those who don't. Think of online retail like um, eBay. Everybody who buys or sells on eBay then gets a rating from other people as to whether or not they were a reliable seller or a reliable buyer. Well, that is a very, very important part of your reputation online. And it signals to anybody who's never met you before whether or not you cooperate or not. 
So this is a really good example of a, a community that's never met but trusts each other to trade because they look at people's reputation. If people renege on that and cheat the system and try and free ride and don't sell the thing they promised they would pen, well, their reputation will go down the pan. So we need mechanisms like that that enable cooperators to find each other and collaborate and that do push those who jump the system out of it. So the system itself becomes, in a sense, self regulating yes. And, yes. and part of your overall message comes into balance of its own accord because it it sends itself signals that, that bring it back into the donut as you would describe it. Yes, although of course I would never go so far as to say we can create an economy that's self-regulating because I, no. I think the financial sector has said for long enough, you know, trust us, we'll regulate ourselves and look what happens. It doesn't. We absolutely need governments to lead in terms of setting clear regulation on what is permitted, like, you know, we should be banning single-use plastics, we should be banning the landfill of plastics, absolutely, give a long, legal and loud message. Once those regulations are in place, people just get on with it. Business adapts, developers adapt, products adapted. People actually become quite creative and use their innovative capacities to think their way around this and actually often enjoy overcoming and figuring out the smartest way to respond to these regulations. Final kind of question for you. I mean, the book came out this year. I think some of the ideas you'd obviously been working on and, and thinking about uh, for some time before that. But how are the ideas being received by kind of governments, companies and others? And, and how optimistic are you about the future? So I wrote this book uh, with the long view. I, I wrote it with a passion for helping to transform economics education because it infuriates me that today's students are taught ideas that are decades, even centuries out of date. So I wanted to be part of the long transformation of the worldview we bring to understanding economics. What's really struck me since my book was published in April is how many of those who are working in the now and the here, the, media, the immediate policymakers in business, in, in politics, who have been interested and asked to meet me, asked to speak to me. They are looking for these ideas. It's so clear that people are hungry for a new paradigm and a new way of understanding what prosperity is. So I've been in discussion with several political parties in this country and overseas. Uh, businesses saying, we, we, this, this is so connected to our vision. We want to be a company that helps bring humanity to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet while making a fair return for ourselves. How can we take this? I've been contacted by city mayors, town planners, saying we want to figure out what it would look like to develop a city district that was meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. So I'm really enjoying these conversations with current policymakers, and I want to, to develop more tools that I'll be able to put on my website for educators, for city planners, for businesses, for investors who want to put these ideas of human well-being at the heart of what they're doing. Well, Kate, it's been uh, a great pleasure for me, and I know the... Um others uh, at the conference to uh, listen to you and for me personally to be able to talk to you and thank you very much for being with us at the Joint Planning Law Conference 2017. Thank you, I'm absolutely delighted to be here.